so yeah, it's just me again. Um, this is my book. So I wrote this book with uh, three... Um, Um, I wrote this book, with, it's co-authored um, by me and three black women that I was at university with. Um, and we were part of a collective called Fly. Um, and it was a group for women and non-binary people of colour. Um, basically, it started off as a social space um, because it was Cambridge and I think three black women saw each other and were like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so they started like a, a collective and they started chatting and it inherently became political kind of within you know a few weeks because you realised that these are these shared experiences. So I, I, you know, by the time I came to Cambridge, it was maybe the third year of Fly had been running. Um, but what we found was that it was such a space of, um, I think I, I would just say any, any good in any of my politics has come from understanding how, how we did what we did there. So that's why it's so inspiring to me to see what you guys are doing here today, because I think it also does, it goes to the question of kind of whether the three years is sustainable. I kind of think actually we've seen such a legacy with what we did, um, say like four or five years ago, and then what you see current students doing, and the conversation is way further on, and like the, the fact that you have like practical um, ideas about what to do is really exciting to me. Um, so I'm just gonna read a poem from this book, but this is not just poetry, this is memoirs, um, political essays, articles, um, and I think what I love about it is that it was all written about three years ago, so it's all in that kind of rawness that we, where we really believe in ourselves, I would say, when we, we really believe in ourselves. I think if you asked me to write a book now, it would feel really awkward, but we didn't, so I don't think that's the beauty of it. Um, one second, let me just find the page. Perfection. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a poem that I wrote while I was studying my undergraduate, um, like I said, in history. Um, and I had this one history supervisor um, who, um, he, I think he loved the idea that I was like, that he, <laughs> I think he loved, he loved my identity, let's say. Um, and yeah, uh, one of them, and he was like, let me show you the world, you know, like I will, I'm gonna teach you. <laughs> So, and I think he loved that we could have a lot of debates about um, my experiences, so that was fun. So this poem is uh, dedicated to him. <laughs> it's called Didn't You Know. I'm going to put this on me because I can't see it. Okay. <clears throat> Didn't you know? White men invented everything. <laughs> His rotting breath spills into my side of the room as he explains to me my humanity. He extracts my limbs from his teeth and deconstructs me on the table amidst cheeses I can't pronounce, as if I too can be consumed and finished off in the next round. <laughs> he deconstructs and dissects in the same way they did so many continents, probably on tables just like this. But didn't I know white men invented everything? They didn't deconstruct, they constructed. Continents wouldn't exist without their toilet paper touch. <laughs> I am not there. I am never there. I am not real outside of his gorge and purple lips. Should I thank him then for mentioning me, for legitimizing my existence? He leans forward. As he does, another white man comes into view, a portrait just above his head, a mirror image minus several hundred years. You mustn't talk only about race, he tells me. We have to consider gender, too. <laughs> I don't know what to say in response. He wants a backpack for having just invented me, for having just created categories to fit my existence into. But his invention of me is my undoing. I cannot now exist outside his mind. I am boxed. I am trapped. I am being contained. Contained in the same way that borders are just pen marks on paper, but also they are pain. And in boxing me, he splits me, segments me, and takes my voice. It used to be a joke that I never finished my sentences, that I was always ready to be talked over ready to be cut off. It used to be a joke that there was silence because nobody listens to silence. He tells me I am abstract, not one thing, but a series of disjointed reports, not real, just skin. Didn't you know white men invented everything? The boxes I am in are not my own, and the words of this poem are the only ones I know, but not the ones I chose to learn. Didn't you know white men invented everything? I look in the mirror and ask if I really know me, if anyone does, because whose performance am I, and in what cage do I belong? I cannot talk only about race, I cannot talk of gender two, for I am not two things, I am one. But didn't I know, white men invented everything. 
the art of talking, the art of being one. They will lie to you that you cannot exist outside their mouths, and thus you must come in bite-sized chunks, palatable. But he does not know that I have invented him. I have invented him not because I need him only to make a point, but he, he cannot forsake me. For to forsake me is to forsake part of his white self that is so visible he thinks it invisible, that he thinks race and gender apply only to me, weapons in his hands they dissolve in mine. I am not there. It is he who is. He invents me so he can breathe. He imagines me so I cannot. Sometimes a poem is not enough because it is only words. And sometimes the poem is too much because it is words, but it's somewhere to exist, outside their mouths. So, but yeah, if, if, you, if anyone's interested, um, and all the money, so it's 13 pounds, all the money goes to, I don't know if you have some, <laughs> so just, you can just come and get them. But, um, <laughs> I'm not going to like but, um, but yeah, all the money goes to buy, so, because um, we never had the money, going back to the session about funding, we never had the money to buy speakers or organise in a, uh, in any kind of way, or to even pay ourselves for our, our, the lady we did at the university. Um, and I'll just do one poem and then leave. Yeah, I'll do one poem and then leave. Um, so uh, this poem is, I think, related to these conversations in, in a lot of obvious ways. Um, but yesterday I was, um, this is related, yesterday I was um, at an event where we were talking about the, the wider implications of um, Shamima Begum's case. Um, and there was a really interesting question that somebody asked about um, how do we, are, or are we trying to move towards um, an understanding of Britishness that doesn't include trauma for people of colour. Um, and it made me think a lot about the conversation we're having today in the sense that if these institutions are so much bound up with trauma for us because of these issues of genocide, colonialism, etc., um, perhaps part of also the process of decolonizing is healing. Um, and perhaps therefore part of that process is not just acknowledgement of what happened, not just accountability, not just reparations, but also a sense that we are able to personally and kind of in a very emotional and, and spiritual way also to heal. Um, so this poem, anyway, is about um, British values, um, because they're part of the counter-radicalization agenda as well, if you didn't know, because obviously British is entirely not violent. So um, <laughs> this poem is, yeah, it's called British Values. Okay. Young Muslims in Britain often straddle two worlds. They appear to have put in each culture concerns revealed around the national identification of Muslims in Britain. Review raises alarm over social integration in the UK schools to promote fundamental British value. The face of Britain is changing beyond recognition. I look in the mirror. It's not shattered. I am whole. No one foot in, one foot out. No reason I've got to learn Britishness for the somehow more devout. I'm not uneasy, torn, or straddling. It's not shattered. I am whole. Yet the opposite is somehow all that you'll get told. I mean, I guess because if it wasn't, we'd face up to the glass. You'd be left with the fact that I am inside. I am Britain now. Because Britain is Bismillah. Britain is basmati rice. Britain is box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bungara. Britain is Bradford and Barking in Birmingham. Britain is biryani and black beans. Britain is black. Britain is brown. Britain is boys blasting dubstep on the bus to town. Britain is body popping outside the tube. Britain is brick lane before it was cool. Britain is bilingual. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is bad at knowing itself, belligerent and boring. Britain has not changed beyond recognition. Recognize it was never one thing. I am the inside you pretend is outside, but we have to stop pretending. Pretending the rolling hills are just romantic, not remnants of injustices swept under a rug. Like the tea didn't come from Asia, like if sugar wasn't grown by slaves, like dry humour isn't a way to just ridicule the sense and cues don't expose the way we're always told to wait for change rather than making it. And it's funny that over-apologising is seen as a national trait, because half of history is still waiting. <laughs> It's not shattered, I am whole. There is no brink or turning point. I'm here. Britain is barbaric. Oh, sorry, did you think that was me? Barbaric <laughs> straddling the boundaries. I'm not quite inside, so you could say I'm the things you forgot, like you're modern, so I'm backwards, you're democratic, so you say I'm not. And the truth is, Britain is blood on its hands and back to the wall. Britain is selling weapons to the most oppressive regimes in the world. Britain is the bombs the Saudis drop on Yemen. 
Britain is building surveillance apparatus since 9-11. Britain is believing in human rights whilst removing them all. Britain is Yarl's Wood, Brook House, Cold Brook, and Morton Hall. Britain is 1,600 dead in or after police custody since 1990. And Britain is no qualms about detaining asylum seekers indefinitely. Britain is suicide attempts, secret courts, and secret torture. Britain is stopping you at the border. Britain is seeing it, saying it, sorting it, which means Britain is also deporting it. <laughs> what else do you do when you look in the mirror and find the sugar and tea have strings attached? The factories on the rolling hills depended on our labour. The bombs destroyed the homes of kids now at the border. Britain is barbaric. Britain is blindly patriotic. Britain is built on false narratives, slices of other people's dishes. Britain is knife and fork polite, stabbing you at will. Britain is selective. Yours till it's not. In yours till it's not. Then blaming you. Britain is borders. Britain is Brexit. Britain is spending on weddings, but not fireproofing homes. Britain is cutting mental health services, yet somehow strong and stable. And Britain is 40% of young people in custody being from ethnic minority backgrounds. And Britain is blaming them for this statistic rather than asking difficult questions, because Britain is blaming the kids who aren't white. Britain is blaming the immigrants. Britain is blaming the Muslims. Britain is blaming bureaucracy. Britain is not listening. Britain is not that great. <laughs> Britain is breaking. But breaking everywhere except the place that puts the blame. Because there's only a few things left that are great about Britain. And they're that Britain is bismillah, basmati, and bilingual. Box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and bungalow. Body popping outside the tube, brick lane before it was cool. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is your greatest nightmare, every repercussion you never thought through. Britain is the terror to be counted. Britain is the mind to be got inside. I am the great and great Britain now. Not you terrified. <laughs>